Christadelphians present This Is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Hello. On behalf of the Christadelphians, I'm Mark Patterson, and our guest with us today is Mr. Howard Schlotman. Welcome, Howard. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be here. Many of you will recognize that as Christadelphians, we believe in God's truth. And we believe that God's truth is revealed to us in the pages of his holy scripture. And so when we come to these programs where we study the Bible together, it's to the Bible that we turn to be sure that we know what God's message is for us. Howard, why don't you take us from there for today's discussion? Fine, Mark. Thank you. Well, you know, other programs in this series have focused on Bible doctrines and Bible topics, and I thought it might be useful today to focus on the Bible itself, Good. God's message to mankind, and not question so much as to whether God wrote the Bible or not, but take it from this angle, if God wrote the Bible, why did he write the Bible? Okay, now you've made an interesting assumption there, and I know it's an assumption that you and I agree, but let's be sure that we understand that that's an assumption we're starting with, is that God did write the Bible, and we'll go from at that point. Over and over in this book, God says, this is my word. This is my message to you. Now, why would he do that? Why would the all-powerful creator, the power behind the universe, send a message to the human race? And the only explanation, I think, that makes any sense is that God has a purpose, and God needs faithful men and women to hear that message about that purpose, and he needs faithful and men and women to fulfill that purpose. And I think this comes through in our first reference, which is in Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet, verse 11. And Mark, if you could read that for us. We're going to be reading from the Rise Standard Version whenever I'm reading from the Scriptures. Um, we'll start here in Isaiah 55. Right, verse 11. And verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall, be, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Well, there you have it. God's message is intended, it's designed, to fulfill God's purpose. And God says it will. So I guess the next question is, what is God's purpose? Sure. What is his purpose with creation? And I think we'll find an answer to that in the next reference, which is in Numbers 14. Numbers 14, 21. And again, I'll be uh, looking that up here. Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. And we read, starting at verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but, in the key verse that we're looking at, verse 21, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And then he goes on from there. That's it. Truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. God wants to fill the earth with something. And that something is the glory of the Lord. Now that's not a term that we use very much glory in, in our day and age, but it's in the Bible very frequently. And I think it certainly includes God's majestic power. But what really distinguishes God is those exceedingly excellent qualities and attributes of God, like love and mercy and uh, compassion and patience and justice and holiness. God wants to fill the earth with those qualities permanently and forever. You know, plants and animals, they can't really glorify God. It's true that a, a gazelle is very beautiful. Uh, you think about a cheetah in full chase, uh -huh. it's awesome machine, right? But, uh, you, oh, how, how about a, a simple uh, bird's nest? When you take a look at that, it's a marvel. And all these things do witness to God, and they, they show his power and his glory. But what animal, what animal can really um, voluntarily show the moral qualities of God? What animal can, uh, for instance, exercise of choice compassion or forgiveness or justice or holiness? See, only men and women have the capacity to reflect the excellence of God's character. So God's purpose then is to fill the earth with a population of people who will be God-like so that when God looks at his earth that he sees a reflection of himself, a God-like creation. A God-like creation is the design and the purpose. And you know what? It's right here at the beginning of God's message to us. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1 and look at verses 26 and 27. Here at the beginning of God's message to us, we hear about a God-like creation. In Genesis chapter 1, at verse 26, we read these words. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now in verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Having created men and women in his image, God says be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We want to remember that phrase. It's going to echo back again to us in a couple other places today. Fill the earth with God-like creatures. That was the purpose. That was the goal. That was the design. And so we know from reading Genesis over and over again that it was shortly after what we've just read in chapter 1 that something went wrong. Something what went wrong? Something went wrong. Man abused the free will that God gave. And so now we're on a detour. You know, we, we do not have a, a world of God-likeness. Men continue to choose their own way rather than God's way. And so instead of God-likeness, we see when we look at the earth, violence, uh, oppression, we see unhappiness, we see a, 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 a trouble everywhere. And that's, and that's sad, but it all stems from ungodly behavior. And that would be really depressing if that was all there was in the scripture. So is there any good news? The good news is God has not abandoned his creation. The good news is God has not given up with his goal to fill the earth with his glory. God, the father of mankind, is building a family. And he invites men and women to become his sons and his daughters. And there's some remarkable verses to go to right here. One of us in a letter that John wrote, the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And let's do that. Way back in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 3. And we're holding on to this idea right now that God is building a family, sons and daughters. Okay, verse 1 is what you'd like me to look That's at? That's it. That's it. 1 John 3, verse 1, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The That's reason... it. That's it. Okay. That was yeah, I mean, part John, of the verse. John is almost uh, breathless as he reads that, or as he thinks that thought. Behold what manner of love that we should be called, the children of God. And you know, there's another passage where uh, in 2 Peter that we could take a look at, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, where he builds on this idea for us. Uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. There's the phrase partakers of the divine nature. God-like creatures in an immortal state. So God will one day fill the earth with a population of people who are God-like. And those men and women who have pleased God by faith and by faithful works during their lives will get to be and become this God-like population of the future. So our earlier question, why would God write the Bible? Uh -huh. Why would he put this message out there, I think is, is answered when we kind of latch on to this idea of invitation. God wants to invite men and women to be part of the wonderful things that are going to be happening on this earth. Now we might want to take a little preview on that. What are those wonderful things? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you now to go over to Isaiah and get this preview for us, Isaiah chapter 11, because this is a, a picture of the coming kingdom of God on earth and it will tell us about Jesus ruling and the, and the outcome of that rule. And let's look at 4 through 9. Okay, and this is a wonderful set of verses to read. Um, I'm going to, again, start a little bit earlier to get the full context here. Middle of verse 3. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist, and the faithfulness the girdle of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The sucking child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. 
For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Did you catch it? The earth shall be filled. The earth shall be filled. There it is again, you know. Uh, great things are being promised. A peace on earth, goodwill among all men and women. This is the message that we're hearing from this, and this is a picture of the future, the great things that are coming. Oppression, violence, war, gone. gone. That's the promise. Uh, pollution, gone. That's the promise. Sickness, sorrow, sadness, gone. That's the promise. And death, ultimately, gone. That is the promise. Instead of what we now see on the earth, we will see what's described as a new heaven and a new earth. And that will be filled with abundance, prosperity, peace, health, eternal life, and glory to God. And those are absolutely amazing promises. Um, you, you can look at any one of those and just marvel at what a difference it is from today and what a beautiful setting that will be in God's kingdom when those are all in place on the whole earth. So going back to some of our earlier thoughts then, how can I be sure? How do we know that those promises that we've read there and, and we see them elsewhere in the scripture, how do we know those will be there? How can we trust God that that will happen? Well, Mark, um, that's a good question. And before we go there, I just think we should also realize that for some people, these do sound incredible. They sound as if maybe they're a fantasy. Okay. And the Bible is absolutely clear about this, that it will take God and it will take Jesus Christ to make these promises happen. And I think we need to look at one more reference on that, and that's going to be in the book of Revelation, verse, uh, chapter 11, and we'll take a look at verses 15 through 18. Because here we have some really strong political uh, information, if you will. Go ahead and read that. All right, starting at Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to thee, Lord God Almighty, who art and who wast, that thou hast taken thy great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but thy wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged for rewarding thy saints, the prophets and saints and servants, and those who fear thy name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. There the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ. That's a political statement. We're talking about a political enterprise that will make these wonderful promises happen in the earth. But they still sound incredible to some yeah, people, don't they? they? sure do. Yeah. And your original question to me was? How can we trust this? How well, do we know that what we've read here, what... Uh, uh, is God's message, that how will we know, how can we trust that those things will happen? Well, those are, those are excellent questions, they're important questions, and I want to answer them. But first, Mark, I want you to go ahead and take this pill and eat it. It's good for you. Uh, what if I said no? <laughs> Mark, what makes you such a doubting creature? What's uh, causing you to, uh, to ask, can I trust this pill? <laughs> I don't know a thing about it. I look at it, there's nothing on it to tell me that uh, what it is, why I should take it. Uh, I've not taken one like this before. <laughs> okay, well, what I hear you saying is I don't, I don't think I can trust this. What would it take for you to trust something or someone? Well, if we're talking about the pill, um, some evidence, <coughs> some, something that would tell me that this was okay. Either I've taken it before myself um, under the proper supervision, proper guidance, or evidence of someone else having taken it, if I'd seen you take it before it. and did okay. it together, you know? <laughs> so, and the, and the topic we're really looking at right now is, can we trust God's message, right? right. That's, That's our, right. our real topic. And you know, even though God is all-powerful, he does not expect us to trust him on blind faith. He didn't make us that way. You just proved it, okay? So God knows we need proof. And so what he does is so that we can believe God and what the Bible says, because the Bible makes some astounding claims, read this book, you'll live forever, uh, all these wonderful things are going to happen someday on the earth, God knows we need proof. What God does is he builds the proof that we need right into the message, right into the very message we're trying to trust, he builds some proof. Proof that God exists, proof that God's the creator, proof that God's involved with his creation, guiding, uh, guiding events in individual lives, guiding events in human history. So all of this is designed to help us trust what God's message is telling us, that he's involved in his creation and he's going to fulfill the purpose which he has promised to fulfill. Everything will move forward and be accomplished. So 
That's why we have this. Okay. So is this the point I give you the globe? This is the point where you give me the globe. <laughs> because we've been talking about the earth, and it's earth that God made, we said, and we found out from the Bible, it has a purpose. Okay? And God is moving forward with that purpose. So I think it m might be possible to say that the Bible is telling us about a journey that the earth is on. The earth is going somewhere. And if that's the case, then some of this journey is over, right? Yes. And what that means is that we can read in the Bible about the journey that's already over, and we can see, for instance, how Israel came out of Egypt and how uh, they went into the wilderness and how Israel then went into their own land and became the kingdom of God on earth, God's chosen people to be a light to the world. We can read about those things. The question is, is how does that help us? Okay. And the, the answer is, this is how. God first predicted all these things that would happen to Israel. He predicted that they would do various things at various stages. And then God worked to make those predictions come true. So what are some of those predictions? Can you give us a couple of examples? Sure, absolutely. In, uh, early in the Bible, in Genesis 15, only 15 chapters in, um, we see... God predicting the course of this nation. He told Abraham, who was the forefather of Israel, that his descendants, the nation of Israel, would go into a hostile nation and be in bondage there. Right. God predicted that he would judge adversely that hostile nation. And then God predicted that he would release Israel out of that nation and take them into their promised land, uh, land of their ancestors, and all of those predictions came true. Another example, in Deuteronomy 28, still early in the Bible, but a little bit later, God made some remarkable predictions. This time he spoke to the nation itself. And I'm going to quote this, where God says in this forecast, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God, you shall be, if you do not, excuse me, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, you shall be plucked up off the land which you are going into to take possession. And the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. Now, here was this nation of Israel, the one that God had chosen to be an example of who he was, a reflection of his glory. And God said that he would work to establish that nation. And yet God predicted that after they settled in, if they rebelled against him, God predicted that he would eject them out of that nation and yeah. scatter them to all the nations of the earth around. And that prediction those predictions took place about 1300 B.C. in Deuteronomy 28. Mm -hmm. So, what really happened? Well, the Bible records, and so does history record, that those people did go into the nation. Israel went into their land. They settled in. And God established them as a kingdom. And we read about that a lot in the Bible. And their history was a mix of good and bad, but it turns out mostly, mostly, bad. mostly bad. Exactly. And, and toward the end, they really moved away from God and all of his ways. So in the Bible, we know that when you move away from God, the direction's always downhill. So what happened? In 721 BC, quite a few years downstream now, 721 BC, the world power at that time, Assyria, came in and took captive all the 10 tribes of the north. And then in uh, 587 BC, the new ruling power of Babylon came in and they took the rest, the southern kingdom, and took it into captivity. All during and preceding the time of these captivities, God pleaded with the people to reform their ways. But he also predicted that if they did not reform, he would specifically employ the Assyrians and specifically employ the Babylonians to be his tools of punishment. That's amazing. And there's more, because God also predicted the demise of all the world powers of that era. Okay. Meanwhile, he predicts the survival of the Jewish race and even predicts that they would return to their ancient homeland. All these predictions came true. And many people don't realize that Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, these are all powers that were specifically predicted to rise and fall, rise and fall in sequence. And history bears out that that did happen. So we see God's hand at work, and of course, as we look around us today, 20th century news uh, confirms the, the other prediction as well, that 
the Jews would return to their homeland. And so we've seen the establishment of, of Israel and then Jews returning to Israel from all nations around the world. Exactly. It's predicted in the Bible. So God has predicted these things and he's brought them to pass. And we might say, well, why did the Almighty bother to predict the future to mere mortals? And why did he go ahead and put it in writing so it could be checked and rechecked and so on? And the only explanation here is that God has a plan with the earth and he cares about his creation and he is involved in human history to move his plan forward God is frankly working his plan that's it very good and it's all part of the invitation that we've been talking about here the Bible message to mankind Bible predictions are built in to the Bible message in order to give us confidence to trust God and his message but remember this journey's not over the journey with Israel is not over and the journey journey with the earth is not over the Bible has a lot to say about things that are yet to happen. There's all kinds of predictions about the good time that's coming on this earth. We read about it earlier right. today. And so we're told a lot more has yet to happen. And so the question here is, we can see what God said he would do with Israel. He, we could see what God predicted he would do with the nations around and the world powers. And then we can go to, to the Bible history and we can go to history in any encyclopedia and we can see that God did what he said exactly he would do. Exactly what he would say. So where does that take us? To the next point if God can be trusted about what he has said he would do then we can trust God about the rest of the journey okay. the rest of the story on the journey is going to happen we know it's going to happen we can have confidence as we read about those things in the Bible message well I'd like you now to read for us in 1st Corinthians 2 9 and we're gonna just change gears a little bit here because we're talking about this wonderful message and why God bothered to write it if you could read uh, 1 Corinthians 2 9 Mark again read, reading from the Revised Standard Version but as it is written what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him what do those words mean to you what no eye has seen no ear heard nor the heart of man conceived that God's prepared a, an amazing thing for us and, and we would be crazy not to want to be part of that glorious age, I think. At the same time, the Bible message is something more than this. It is a message of comfort and help and hope because we live in troubled times. We live in a dark age, really. You know, we're, we're facing some very difficult circumstances as we are in the 21st century. You know, in this part of the world, we're very comfortable. We have a great abundance and people are able to have health care and, and uh, take, you know, uh, lots of money and put it here and put it there and invest it and so on but in other parts of the world not quite the same we're not we're seeing people without the basic necessities you know we also see people who are victims of oppression and war meanwhile a pollution is increasing the natural resources are depleting right. and the weapons of mass destruction are everywhere and maybe on a more personal note or a personal level in our own neighborhood you don't know I don't know whether you or I or one of our loved ones might not just suddenly become a victim of random violence or terrorism. We have this dark age that we live in and we need some hope because there's a lot of evil out there. And I'd like to read um, a passage in Psalm 33 out of the King James Version here that I think shows that the Bible is a message of hope for our, our current journey as we go towards that great age that's coming. Here's the, here's the message of the psalmist. The Lord brings the counsel of the heathen to naught, to nothing. He makes the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. The Lord looks from heaven. He beholds all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looks upon the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considers all their work. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. And a mighty man is not delivered by much strength. Now he gets personal. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. You know, I, what we hear here is the counsel of God will supersede the counsel of man. Mm -hmm. Now, we said we lived in a, in a dark age, an evil age, and that's true. But the message here is that God is in control. God cares about his creation. And God has, has in the past demonstrated and continues to demonstrate that he will regulate the evil that we see out there. He's not going to let it become 
uh, endless, and he's going to regulate it, and he's going to prevent the abuse of free will. Now, that, that obviously, when God's plan is complete, there will be no evil, and there will be no evildoers. But until that time, yes, uh, good people will suffer some bad things. The servants of God have never been exempt from uh, adversity and trials, and yet God promises to see them through their trials and through their adversities and their sufferings, and will actually harness those adversities to make them better suited to this life and to his service now and eternally. So one of the comforting messages in the Bible is that God is in control. And I know we're about out of time, Mark, <clears throat> and one of the greatest reasons to trust God and the message of the Bible we haven't brought up today. We didn't do it in the interest of developing these other points. Right. But as we accept the invitation, God's invitation to be his sons and his daughters, and to get on that journey towards the great age to come, we find out that we fall short. We don't always perform as God's children, not like we should. We sin, and when we sin, that separates us from God. And one of the greatest evidences of God's love for his creation and his love for us is him providing Jesus Christ as our Savior. Jesus is the cure for sin, and that's another topic uh, for another time. So, Howard, let's take just about a half a minute here, if you could, to wrap up your thoughts and summarize the key thoughts you'd like us to take away from today's discussion. Well, I think we've seen that the Bible tells us the earth is on a journey. The earth has a purpose. God wants to fill the earth with a population of people that will be God-like. So God is calling out of every generation and every age, he's calling out people to build a family with, okay. to be sons and daughters of God in the age to come so that they can be that population of people that will be God-like in an immortal state. And when God finally looks at his creation, when it is all finished, it truly will fill the earth with his glory. Well, Howard, thank you very much. This has been a, a fascinating time spent together. Thank you. And uh, as, we've, as we've looked over in almost a philosophical sense of what God's plan and purpose is with the earth, um, I think it's helpful for us to go back to one of the points you've made about the earth being filled with God's glory because we certainly all can see God's glory on any given day in, when it's raining and we can see the rainstorm and oftentimes the, the rainbow following that, um, oftentimes just the beauty of the world around us. But that's not the glory that you had us focused on, is it? No. It's the glory of his character, his compassion, and his love for, for each of us. Those exceedingly excellent qualities which make God really who he is. Yeah. Uh, we thank you for sharing your time with us as we've looked at this important Bible message about the glory of God. The Christadelphians would like to thank you for watching our program. and would like to invite you to take advantage of this free literature offer that deals with many of the points discussed on today's program. We'd like to send you this booklet free of charge and free of any obligation. Just call us right now at 1-800-TO-BE-SURE. That's 1-800-TO-BE-SURE. Leave your name and address and please refer to this offer number. Call in for this free booklet and see what it has to say about the Word of God and the future that God has planned for this earth. So call right now, 1-800-TO-BE-SURE.